Okay, all right. So thanks for joining us, everyone. We will be recording this. There were quite a few people who expressed interest, but as always, it's difficult to bring session together time that works for everyone. But we will record it so that it can be distributed afterwards. I'm just going to do a couple of introductions first. Um, Brad will be running the presentation today, and I've just given a back, bit of background here. Uh, Brad and I both work in the Statistical Consulting Centre, with, which is within the National Institute for Applied Statistics Research Australia. And uh, we both use R regularly. Uh, um, Brad actually develops R packages. He's a very proficient R user, and I use R Studio on a day-to-day -day basis as well. And I also use a lot of other packages as does Brad through our role in statistical consulting. So we're giving this talk as part of the UOW Data and Decision Science Initiative. And I'll just very briefly outline that most of you have heard this before. We give this introduction at most of our presentations. So the Data and Decision Science Initiative has four areas of focus. There's a research focus where we're bringing together a virtual network of researchers and students within the university community who are interested in data science. And we also have a number of working groups that are focusing on both research and teaching. And what we're doing today is underlined there, we have themed meetings where we're emphasizing translation. So we try and give presentations on topics that are of interest to the university community and of benefit um, to the university in terms of developing our data science capacity. We also do a lot of education in two different roles. So we do training and this session could be regarded as part of that training. We do both internal and external training and we also run workshops. So we run those through the GRS and the Statistical Consulting Centre and I'll give some information about that at the end. We're also looking at producing two T-shaped graduates who are data literate, and we're doing that through reviewing some of our undergraduate subjects. And we also have a role for the university in external engagement and promoting our role and our expertise in data science through the wider uh, university community and with industry. So I guess I'll summarise by starting at the end here. So we're going to go through a very quick introduction of how to get started with R today. But basically, I've tried to summarise the points here by just saying you all from, from the beginning point, you should use R if you're intending to spend a lot of time cleaning, manipulating, visualising and analysing data. So if you've chosen a career path where you're going to see for the foreseeable future, that data manipulation and analysis is a substantial component of it, then it's worth investing the time in learning R. If you're responsible for analysis where you've got to do a lot of reporting or write publications that are now increasingly focused on reproducible research, then again, you should be using R because it inherently supports that capacity. If you're managing multi multiple data projects and you need to keep track of things, R is very useful for that. And also, particularly if you're a student, if you want a skill that gives you a competitive advantage for career choices, then R is really valuable to have on your CV. A lot of people are looking for this skill in the workplace. Now, reasons that you may not want to invest in learning R are that if you only do an occasional frequency table, bar plot, or basic analysis, on data that's, some, that's usually prepared by someone else. So, for example, if you're a supervisor engaged in a lot of other um, administrative activities and really you just need to have a look at some data to get some basic ideas about it, then perhaps one of the point-and-click packages would be more useful for you or whatever you're familiar with. And also there is a time investment, which I'll talk a little bit about, so you need to be committed to that to be able to invest in maintaining your R skills. So are there alternatives? There are a couple, and I'm not going to really talk about those very much today. There is also Python, which some um, researchers in the university use, and Python is a more general programming language, and it is certainly an alternative. 
there also there are also some driving the commercial packages now to integrate reproducible research and improve their reporting capacity. So there are some alternatives, but R in particular, because it's free and open source, which I'll talk about, is a really um, transferable skill to have in today's market. So I've just put R with R Studio on posit in brackets there because most people use R through what's called an integrated development environment, which is what we'll be using today when we use R Studio. It is changing its name next month to posit, so there'll be more information about that coming along. The main advantages and why R has really taken off is because it's free and open source. It has been around for a long time. It's been around since 1995. And it relies on an active user community to develop and maintain the packages. So it also has a commercial arm and that supports business and funds the free development of the, the package itself. So this is important in terms of thinking about longevity. There is a commercial backing behind this, which is supporting the free enterprise. It's got extensive and standard and advanced statistical methods in it and there are constantly increasing statistical packages being developed that are discipline specific and you can also develop your own uh, statistical package that's something brad's been doing he's just developed a couple recently and it encourages reproducible research some disadvantages are that it does have a steep learning curve there are dependencies which do as as relies on this user community to develop and maintain these packages. Sometimes if a person who's developed a package changes jobs or retires or no longer works in the area, they, they decide not to maintain a package. Usually now you get a warning about that sort of thing, but if you've been working with the package for years and it's suddenly not available anymore, then you may have to change your research or teaching materials. There are workarounds. They do require a bit of advanced knowledge, but it is important to warn up front that that is one of the cons of using it. This is not unique to, to uh, packages like R. Other commercial packages do have major upgrades as well. It's changing constantly, so you do need to stay up to date. And there are two different ways that you can really focus on using R. So it is... Um, a bit of a drawback that sometimes you have to interface between these methods. There are some user interface packages, and this is a slide from a previous presentation we gave you, uh, and we'll put the link to that at the end. So if you're interested in using R, but you prefer a point and click option, there are some here, and we've previously done presentations on that, as I've said. Okay, so I'll just stop sharing now and hand over to Brad. Files into the chat. Um, because I'd love it if you people wanting to join along with me, if, they, if they're new to R and want to try it out, um, they'll have the opportunity to do it. Or you can, of course, uh, you know, review this at a later date um, and work through it at your own pace. But um, as Marika said, I'm going to just take us through just maybe getting started with R. Um, it can be a little bit tricky and a little bit daunting. Um, to get started with a brand new package, especially one which is a coding language base. Um, and so it can often seem, especially just trying to get your data in and getting it sorted. Um, so what I will do is I'll share my screen and I'll start with a brief explanation about how you actually install R because it's a little bit different to perhaps how you, know, you, would, you would start with other packages. The first thing is you need to install R. R is like the brain behind all of, all of what happens. And then what we're going to do is install, as Marika talked about, R Studio, um, which is just a nice interface to help us use R in a, you know, a much more user-friendly kind of way. Um, so I've got some instructions here. I'm going to put them up on the website later. Um, but essentially, you know, all you have to do is go to Google and if you Google CRAN R or R download, um, it'll take you to the CRAN website. And CRAN's the comprehensive R archive network. It's where all uh, the R doc downloads files are, are saved and where you download packages from. And we, we talked about packages um, just before. So I've got a Windows computer, so I would click this link and I can just download R uh, 4.2.1. They do regular updates of R versions. 
Um, usually once every four or five months, I think it tends to come out. Um, and it doesn't usually affect much of the functionality. It's just a little bit of the back ending um, that tends to get upgraded. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that's not true. So uh, we, we do keep an eye out for when, when some changes are made. But generally, for your standard statistical analyses, um, when a new R version comes out, it's not going to affect too many things. Um, so if you click that button, I'm not going to do it because it might break my internet. So, But you will get a file that looks like this downloaded. And all you have to do is double click it and you know, a standard installer will open. This is what it kind of looks like. Um, all you have to do is next through it. You know, if you're so inclined, you can read the terms, but I'm not sure if anyone actually does. Um, and it will install it onto your computer and your programs directory. Now, if you don't have admin privileges, um, like if you've got a company managed computer, um, and you can't be bothered calling up your IT department to get it installed, you can also install it into your documents folder and use it without, uh, without requiring admin privileges. It just complicates things slightly when we're looking, when you're trying to load in paths and, and things, but um, absolutely, you don't absolutely need uh, admin privileges to install it. But once you install R, um, you know, you could, it, it basically, that's the kind of the brain of it. Now we're going to get the dressing, um, and that's R Studio. And to get R Studio, again, you can just Google it. R Studio, first link up. Um, click the download the R Studio IDE. Now, as Marika said, they've got some commercial products as well. We're not interested in the commercial products. We're more interested in the free uh, version. So if you look at this one, R Studio Desktop, that's the free version. If I click download, it will take me down the page to this button where again, I can download the installer. And all you have to do is follow the prompts, just like uh, you don't need admin privileges, uh, but if you do have admin privileges, it will install to your programs folder. If you don't have admin privileges, it will install to your documents folder. Um, but again, very straightforward. And essentially that's all you need to do to start to get using uh, Studio and R. You need a version of R and you need to download Studio, and then you're ready to go. Um, so let's have a look at maybe, uh, seeing what our studio looks like when you open it. Now, of course I use our studio quite often, so mine might look a little bit different, uh, to how you, yours looks when, if you open it for the very first time, just because I've got some preloaded settings in there, but I've tried to make it look as similar to what it will look like if you were to open it for the very first time. So I've got it open here. Um, I've also got open this, my little guide here to let me know what to do next. Um, of course, if you open a brand new session, you're not gonna have that guide there, um, but it will look something similar to this. And so this is our studio. Um, and you can see I've got three panes open or three little sections of my screen open. Um, over here, we've got in the top right, we've got a couple of different tabs. Uh, but the most important tab uh, we have here is our environment tab. And this is kind of like the thing that R has stored in its memory. This is what R is remembering. And right now it knows nothing. It's got nothing stored. It, I haven't told it to remember anything. There's other tabs here, um, which we don't really have time to go through and explaining all of them. Um, but essentially they can help when you want to do more advanced um, our analysis, and I will direct your attention to this tutorial tab, because this one gives if uh, gives some advice and some tutorials on how to actually use R using the Learn R package. Um, now, if you're opening it for the first time, you might have to download this Learn R package in order to see what I'm seeing right now, um, but that's okay because I'll show you how to install a package um, uh, in a moment. All right. So we've got now environment tab. We've also got down in this bottom right window, a couple of different uh, tabs that we'll probably end up using all of. Um, right now I've got the viewer tab open and that's because I'm viewing a document that I created. Um, but for you, if this is the first time opening, you're likely to have your files tab open. And that looks a bit like this. Um, it might be somewhere different on your computer uh, where it is. Um, I've got it on my desktop at the moment, 
but essentially it is, you know, just looking like your file explorer, but you can see it within the R Studio uh, uh, user interface. And if we, if we, uh, you know, we can actually navigate, I probably shouldn't do that. Um, you can actually navigate into folders um, and have a look at what the different files are. The other plot, uh, the other tab we have is the plots tab. Now, this is where when we produce plots with our code, um, our plots are going to be displayed. And as you can see, you can kind of see a few different um, options here. So if I want to save them as images, I can do that once I generate a plot. We'll have a look at that further um, when we go into it. The packages tab, well, again, we'll talk about further, but this is what we were talking about when we're talking about statistical packages. They're basically just little um, pro, uh, chunks of R code that other people have written um, that you can uh, load up and apply their code in order to do all sorts of statistical analyses. And it is quite common nowadays that when statisticians uh, come up with new methods and new methodologies, that they produce their own R package um, or their R software that they can then share to everyone else so they can apply their methods. So it's really kind of um, a great way of encouraging uh, modern, you know, you know, up to date, the best kind of uh, analyses possible. Um, at the given time. The help window is great because it gives you uh, instructions if you ever get stuck. Um, it gives you a bit of explanation about certain functions and certain processes. Um, and we'll look at, at this one a little bit later again as well. All right, so um, if we've got our, our, our studio, we've got our bottom right window, let's have a look at the left window. Now this is R. So this, what we're calling the console here, this is what R is. It's essentially like a calculator. Um, and we're going to do all of our analysis within this console. And we're going to get it to, we're going to use this console to generate all of our, our, our plots and things like that. It is just a command line um, thing. So we tend to feed things in one line by line, or you can feed in a script and do a whole heap of analyses at once. Um, and, you know, we can see uh, if R is working, you know, I said it's like a calculator, it should be able to do simple calculations. So if I just type in one plus one, there you go, it tells me that's two. And you can do, you know, two times four plus three divided by three. Oh, I put an and there instead of a times, there we go. Two times four plus three divided by three. There we go, we end up with nine because we've got eight plus one. Yeah, so it understands. Um, the order of operations as well too. Alrighty, um, so when you first open R, it's good practice to start with an R script. And an R script is basically like a recipe document. It's, it's the thing that we, we put up in the top corner um, that we, we use to save the codes we put in here so I can do it again later. Because if we're just typing codes into the command line, you might want to repeat code and you don't have to remember exactly what you typed again. So to open an R script file, all you do is you go up to file, you go new file and you click R script, sorry. My thing's a little bit small on my big monitor. And what will happen is this fourth pane will open up and this is the source pane. And so, the R script file is basically just a text document. So there's nothing fancy about it. Um, and what, what you can put in here is any code that you might wanna, um, you know, replicate down the, down the track. Um, now, the thing about script files is that you should only really add to it uh, executable code. And what that means is you should only really add into it text that I can feed into my console. Because ideally what I wanna do is run from my script file, um, all the things in it into my console. And if I just want to write, you know, normal text, you know, should I learn R? If I just put that into the console, R's not going to know what you're doing because it's not code, it's just normal text. So if you want to add normal text, what you do is you add a, a hash in front of it. So if I put a hash here and I write, should I learn R? It's fine. It's not going to give me an error. I is going to be like, yep, I know I need to ignore that. So it's going to be fine. And so I can use these comments to basically add titles, you know, describe what's going on in my script. 
So, and all I did there was copy and paste what's in my console up to my script. Now, if I want to run this line of code in the console, I don't have to copy and paste it from my script and put it into here. I can highlight it and click run, and it will again go back into my console, or I can highlight it, press control enter, and it will run just that line. In fact, you don't even have to highlight it. You just have to go control enter on the line, and it will run that line. Um, but as you go along and you do analyses, what you should be doing is once you get it right, copy and pasting it into your script so you can run it again later, right? So you can keep track of everything you do. And then if you have to do the analysis again, you don't have to go through the process of, you know, remembering all the commands. You just run the script and it will do all the analysis. All right. So that's kind of the basics of, you know, the layout of R. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is setting up what's called a working directory. And a working directory is basically just a place on your hard drive where R knows where you kind of feed in your data or where you save your data. It's kind of like um, a place on your hard drive where you work out of. That's why it's called a working directory. And I'm just gonna create one on my, on my desktop for us to work on today. Um, and if you, if, you, if you read this document, I do mention that you can also get R to create a working directory for you by going new project. And you can, a little window will pop up eventually. Come on. Maybe not. Um, a, a little window will pop up, which will um, advise you whether or not you want to create a new an ex a new directory, and you can you can do it that way. Um, I work out of projects because projects are also a good way of sharing with others via services like GitHub and and other things like that. So it's a good way to give you self contained little sessions for you to work on various different projects. Um, but for us, we don't need it. So let's. Let's just create a, a working directory manually on our desktop. So I'm going to create a new folder on my desktop. And I'm going to call it, should I learn R? Because that's what today's called. And what I'm going to do in this, in this folder is I'm going to add all the, all the files that I, um, I'm going to use for today's kind of talk. I'm just going to copy and paste them in here. And if I open it up, Yep, that's all. That's all that's in there. All right. There we go. That's the window that's supposed to open when I, I have new projects. So you can get a new directory or you can link to an existing one as well. All right. So once I get that, uh, that working directory folder created, I can tell R where to find it. And the way you do it is you go up to this session uh, button up the top and you go to set working directory. And the easiest way to do it is to just go choose directory and then navigate to it. So for me, I put it on my desktop. Here it is, should I learn R and click open. And as you can see, this code pops up. Now for you, it's not gonna have Bradley W, it's gonna have whatever your username is um, and wherever you've saved it, but that's gonna be your working directory. And so it's really good for us to, so I don't have to do this process manually ever again, I can just copy that and add it up to my script. And so next time when I want to run all the code that we're going to look at today, all I have to do is run that button and it knows exactly where the working directory is. Um, and if I go to my files, um, you can see it's opened up to my should should learn R, should I learn R folder. Um, now, if it if it's somewhere else and you need to get to your should I learn R folder, all you have to do is click the more button and click the go to working directory. Um, and that's where it does. And, you know, just a, another thing, if you wanted to change your working directory and you can navigate it via here, you can also set as working directory using this option and it will be wherever you're open to at the moment, that's going to be saved as your working directory. All righty. So um, now that I've got that kind of set up, I can load, I can begin to load data in and out of R. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to have to install some packages because <laughs> for, for a lot of these commands, um, installing packages um, is a way to is is the way to go. And there's one package that we're actually going to be using to load in our data, and that's called Read Excel, and it's a package that knows how to read Excel worksheets. Uh, so the basics is. Um, 
essentially packages contain analyses that aren't in the standard base R. And so if you want to use any functions that's not in standard base R, you have to install that package. The first thing you do is you have to install it onto your computer. So the way you do it um, is you can click the packages tab and you click install. And what will happen is this little window will pop up and it will search on the CRAN repository. And there are like thousands and thousands of packages on the CRAN repository. And you just start typing in what it is that you want to install. And I want to install the package read Excel. So I'm going to start typing in read Excel. You can see how many packages there are on CRAN that has read in its name, but it searches, oh yep, there it is, read Excel. That's the one I want to install. Double click that. And then I click install. Now this is just telling you whereabouts it's going to install that, that package on your computer. Um, but you should be able to just leave that at the default. You don't have to specify a specific directory for that. And click install. And the code, it will run some code. It will run this line of code, install.packages, read Excel. And very cleverly, R knows where to look, how to download it, and how to install it. You only need to install packages once uh, onto your computer. Once it's installed onto your computer, you don't have to install it again, unless you upgrade your R or you wipe it or you know uninstall it and then reinstall it, then you will have to reinstall the packages. But generally, once you've installed it, you're good to go um, and you don't have to install it again. But you do have to load it. So every time you open a new R session, you do have to load the packages that you're interested in. And you can do that by just scrolling down this list until you find the one you want to list. Sorry, I've got lots of packages installed because I use a lot of packages, but um, I will go find. In fact, I could just search it in here. Read Excel should come up. There it is. That's the one I want. So I tick that button and it will load the library. Um, now, if you don't want to have to search through this list, and again, you want to just run the script from the from the onset, I can just copy that library code and paste it in here. Library, read Excel, and then it will automatically tick that button for me. Okie dokie. Um, and this is what these instructions just say. So anytime you want to install a package, all you have to do is you can use the packages thing, or if you know the exact name of the package, you can use this code directly to install it. Um, but that might be something you do if you're a little bit more familiar with, with using R. All right, I've got the read Excel package installed. Um, so now I can import data into R. Um, now, R Studio is pretty clever. And if I hadn't, if I didn't install Read Excel, it probably would have told me that I needed to install Read Excel and then installed it for me. But I'm just wanted to show you the process of installing a package. So if you didn't do that and still were able to use this, um, that's probably because R Studio um, is pretty clever and can and can work out that you need to you need to have installed that package. But um, to in, to to import data, we can use R Studio to do it. Um, and the way we do it is we go up to file, we go to import data set, and here you can see a few different options. I can uh, import it from a text document. So that's like a tab delimited file. Um, I can, or a CSV file, that's all text-based. I can do it from Excel as in an Excel worksheet. I can do it from an SBSS.SAV file. I can do it from a SAS file and I can do it from a starter file as well. Um, and there's there's other ones as well that you can install from, but these are the most common. So they put them in the in the R Studio IDE. Now the thing I want to in the, the data I want to import is an Excel document. It's called cholesterol. Um, and I put it into my working directory. And so I just go import data set from Excel. And here I can click browse. And it should open my working directory and there it is click open and i'll get this nice little viewer that helps me install uh, to um, load it in and i get a i get a brief overview of what my data looks like now this data is actually uh cholesterol uh, chronic health heart disease data which tracks um, a few different variables it came from a larger data set that we use quite a lot in machine learning and and statistics um, but i've just kind of narrowed down the number of columns slash variables. We call very columns variables or variables columns. Um, that's just the kind of language we use. Now, if it was on a different sheet, 
in Excel, I can just ch check this option, but I only have the one sheet called cholesterol. So, you know, but if you wanted to do it from a separate sheet or from a, a specific sheet, you can do it there. Um, you can also, you know, skip cer a certain amount of rows or you can only do it for certain ranges. There's a lot of functionality there as well. Um, but when you're ready, you just click import and it imports the data. And you can see now in my environment, I've got this cholesterol data loaded in. Um, now, if I wanted to load this in again, all I have to do is, and I'm actually going to call this instead of cholesterol, I'm going to call this data. So I'm going to, uh, and I'll show you how to change the name because I didn't show you that. If I changed it here to data, that's how you change the name. Um, and I just forgot to do that then, but that's okay because all I have to do is copy and paste this code up here. Um, get rid of that. In fact, I don't need the sheet because it knows that there's only the one sheet in there. And instead of calling it cholesterol, I'm going to call it data. And so what I'm saying, I want to save this document into a, an object called data. And if I run that, I've now got data saved into my, my environment. All right, let's just have a look at how our C's or kind of um, prints data, that data frame of cholesterol data. Um, if I return it, I can get a, a, a brief preview. This is because this is called what's called a Tibble um, object, but it's essentially what's also called a data frame. Um, but it's, it's, it's a common way in which we, we uh, load in data. And notice that this is what's called in what's called rectangular form. I have columns that are named, and then I have rows um, with my values in it, right? So if you've got data that's not quite in this form, you might have to do a little bit of manipulation in order to get it into R in the correct form uh, for analysis. Alrighty, um, well, now that I've got my data loaded in, let's have a look at doing some statistics on it. First and foremost, let's just try to get a summary of each of the different variables or columns in my, in my data set. So I'm just gonna go summary data. And what pops up is a list uh, of age. We've got the minimum value of age, the first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartile and the max. Essentially, it's the five number summary uh, with the mean as well. Um, if you're, if you're familiar with that, that kind of language in statistics. Um, now that's what's happened for age, uh, the uh, rest blood pressure, the cholesterol data, and the CHD variable, which is actually a zero one variable telling me whether or not that particular patient has chronic heart disease. Um, and so you can see that because it was zero one, it's treating this as a numeric variable. It's not treating it as a categorical thing. It's treating it as a numerical thing by default. Gender, on the other hand, or gender category, um, only has two categories in it and is a character. So it, it just says, and we can have a look exactly what it says in it by putting a dollar sign. That allows me to access specific columns of my data frame. And I'm interested in the gender column. And you can see, okay, it's a character thing. And by character, I mean it's letters um, that says either female or male. And it's actually been sorted in that in that regard. So that's why it's giving something that's not as much of a um, <laughs> not as much detail as perhaps we would have liked. All right. Um, if we want to just do some of these basic statistics individually without all of the other um, variables, and I just want to calculate, say, the mean cholesterol of my data set, all I have to do is use the function mean. Right, it's in the base R, so you don't have to install any packages to do it. And I tell it what I want to calculate the mean on. In this case, I want it to do it on the cholesterol column of my data frame. So if I do that, it spits out 6.396475. And remember, this is like a calculator. So if I wanted to do any transformations or you know, you know, what's that minus two? I can do that again as well. All right, so R's pretty clever that way. Um, other common, uh, other common uh, statistics we might be interested in, standard deviation, uh, five number, summary. Uh, um, and that should give us the same kind of information 
that we spat out when we did summary on data, right? Let's have a look. So we look at the cholesterol thing, 3.28. Yep, cool, that's our minimum. That's our first quartile. That's our median. That's our third quartile. And that's our max, right? It's just nicely labeled here so we can remember. But it's it, that's what the five number summary uh, output looks like. Um, but these statistics are all appropriate for what are essentially numeric variables. Um, but for variables that are categorical, we, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be calculating the mean um, or, the, or the variance or standard deviation in this kind of way. Instead, what we want probably is a frequencies count, right? We want to know how many males and how many females are in the data. And we can do that by using the, the table function. And if I go table, I can go to data and I can select gender. There we go. R Studio is nice in that it helps you <coughs> remember what you called your columns. Because if you're anything like me, I constantly forget what I call my columns. So I just use that to be able to find out. And if I return that one, it tells me I have 96 females and I have 201 males. And if I wanted to know, well, what proportion is that? I can just divide that by the number of rows in my data frame. Right. And that will give me my proportions. So 32% female um, and 68% uh, male. Right. Let's also do that for the CHD because that is a categorical uh, variable, even though it's us treating it as if it's a numeric variable because it is just zero one data. Um, and I've got 160 zero corresponds to doesn't have heart disease, one corresponds to has heart disease. And I didn't actually include it here, but if we want to make sure R knows that this is a categorical variable, what we can do is actually tell R that this should be treated as a factor. And if I wrap that in this function factor, um, then it will know that actually this is a categorical variable, zero, one. And in order to actually make sure that it does it from now on, I have to override the, ex the existing column with this new categorical variable factor. All right, so that's that was your kind of your univariate statistics. Um, we also might be interested in what we call our bivariate statistics. Um, and this is when I'm trying to compare two variables. And I've given a brief summary here. So if I've got two continuous or numeric variables, I might wanna calculate a Pearson correlation. Um, the way I do that is I just, you know, put in whatever two uh, variables I wanna calculate the correlation of. In this case, it's going to be cholesterol and age and return that my correlation between age and cholesterol is 0 0.2. You notice the thing about R is it only does what you tell it to do. It doesn't do any more. It doesn't do any less. You tell it to calculate a correlation, it will calculate a correlation. It won't do anything, anything else other, unless you tell it to. Um, and so that gives you a lot more control. Um, in the first thing, but it also means you have to, you know, learn quite a lot of code as well. But, you know, I, I, I would be lying if I said that I remember all the code I use all the time. Most of the time I end up Googling a lot of it. Um, you know, for these common ones, you, it becomes second nature. Uh, but for, you know, more uh, complex analyses, you end up Googling the code a lot. So Google is your best friend when it comes to, to learning R, really. All right, if I wanted to do a cross tabulations for two categorical data, uh, to two categorical variables, I can use the table uh, function again. And all I do is add a comma between them. So I want a table, in this case, gender and CHD, chronic heart disease status. And I can see that 71 females have, don't have chronic heart disease, 25 do, 89 males don't have it, and 112 do on our data set. Um, and the last one is when we want to compare uh, or calculate st uh, statistics on the numeric variable, but for different categories or for different levels of our of our of our data. Um, and we can use this aggregate function to do it. And all I do is I type aggregate, whoop, not a triple G, aggregate, and I tell it what column I want it to. Um, what, what's the numeric column that goes as this guy up here. So I want to do it for cholesterol and I want to do it uh, for the different categories of gender. And I have to tell it what 
statistic I wanted to calculate, and that's what this fun, it stands for function, um, not just because statistics is fun, um, and I tell it to calculate the mean. And the last thing I need to do is I need to tell it what data set to look for these variables in, and I've called that data set probably uninspired, inspiringly uh, data. So if I do that, I can then calculate um, the mean cholesterol for females in my data set and the mean cholesterol for males in my data set. And if I wanted to do more levels of categories, all I have to do is add a plus here and say I wanted to do it for different levels of CHD. It will look at all the possible combinations of gender and CHD. So you just add a plus. And this, this kind of um, notation in R is pretty common. And the way we kind of read it is that we want to look at cholesterol, and this is this represents like by. So I want to look at cholesterol by gender and CHD, or just by gender, right? So I want to look at cholesterol by gender. It's the way you kind of read this uh, this syntax. Okie dokie. Um, well, that was some statistics. Let's get plotting. And I'm going to add some comments here. And it's good to comment your data. I don't comment enough, as you can probably tell. Um, so now I want to do some plotting. And plotting in R, again, it's pretty easy to get an initial thing to get more customized stuff. It requires a little bit more coding because, again, R only does what you tell it to do. So if I want to produce a histogram of my cholesterol data, which is great for numeric variables to get the sense of distribution, I just tell it to cal uh, calculate a histogram on my cholesterol data. Right. And there I get this nice looking uh, histogram out. And notice it's opened it in my plots tab, All right? So I can go back to my viewer tab, but of course it takes it to the top, um, but it opens it in my plots tab. Um, next time I might want to calculate, oh, what, what, which one do we want next? Is it a box plot? Yeah, let's have a look at calculating a box plot. Now box plots are great, um, just like histograms, you get a sense of the spread of the data and the center of the data and the skewness of the data, but they're also great when you want to compare across different categorical levels. Um, so to do a box plot in R, all you have to do is write box plot, and I'm going to use the same syntax as I used before. I'm going to go cholesterol, because that's my numeric variable, by gender. And I have to tell it what data set I'm getting this from. So I'm going to talk about data equals to data. I run this code and I get these nice box plots potting up. And here I've got, you know, the box plot of female cholesterol data and uh, male cholesterol data here. Um, and the next one I want to look at is what if I want to compare two continuous variables uh, to uh, two numeric variables side by side? Well, the best way to do that is with a scatter plot. Um, and if you want to do a scatter plot in R, you can just use the plot function. Pretty simple. You tell it which one you want to be your x variable. So I have x equals, and I might want age to be my x variable. Um, I want well, my y variable cholesterol. I have to tell it that it's within data. So I'm going to go data dollar sign cholesterol. And if I just plot that, I get an initial scatter plot popping out. All right. Not the most interesting scatter plot, it doesn't have any titles and things. Um, but if I want to customize my plots, I absolutely can. Now, it's often tricky to remember how you customize all these things. You do it by adding what's called additional arguments. So each time I have an x equal or a y equals or whatever I put into these, these brackets of the function, these are effectively input arguments we're putting in. And to remember what input arguments control what, it can be a bit tricky. So this is where the help documentation comes in really handy. If I just write help and then put it in whatever function I want to get a little bit more info on um, and run that in my console, it will plop up the help tab. And for here, I just want to do generic XY plotting and it will give me my help document uh, related to it. And these things can be a little bit tricky to first um, understand, but essentially you think of it as um, this is how you kind of put it into the console. This is what you put into it. So this is what you put in these brackets when you initial, initially uh, put it in. And if there's a values where the, there isn't values here, there's, if there's a values heading, that's what you get out of it. In this case, what you get out of it is a plot. 
And so if I want to change the title of the plot, all I have to do is look down here in my arguments and I can see that main is the argument that controls uh, the title. So if I copy and paste this guy down below, whoa, copy and paste this guy down below, and I add main equal to, let's just call scatter plot, and I run this again, now I've added a title. Right, so you can customize this however you want, and you can do all sorts of really complex customizations, but you need to write the code to do it. So it, it takes a little bit to get started. Um, but once you're used to it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I will just mention that there is another way of doing plotting in, uh, in R, which is kind of what we call within the tidyverse framework of packages, and the plot's called ggplot. Uh, the package is called ggplot2, um, and it's using what's called the grammar of graphics. Now, um, I'm a big fan of ggplot2. It's something that I am very fond of, but we don't really have time for me to explain it in detail here. Um, but you can get some really cool uh, visualizations out from ggplot. Um, this is the kind of syntax you see. So it's, it's structured very differently to the normal kind of structure of coding that we're doing in what's called base R. Um, but if you wanna, if you wanna really get into data visualization in R, learning ggplot is a really good way of doing it. Um, and once you kind of understand the structure, it's actually pretty straightforward. It looks complicated right now, uh, but it's actually pretty straightforward to do. Um, Brad, there's just, a, there's just a question in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. Michelle has asked if you have to um, cut and paste from the top to the console to run. And I've said, no, you just have to press the run button. But could you demonstrate that from the screen? Yeah, yeah, sure. So Thanks. you can highlight this and click run. Um, you can just, I think, put the cursor there and then click run. Um, and what I've been doing, which you probably can't see because I'm using hotkeys, is if you go control enter, that will also run it. And so it knows just to run that one line that your cursor's on. I like to do my running line by line. Um, but then once I finish writing my script, I highlight the whole thing and then I run it all together. You know, So in theory, because I've structured this code fairly well, I can highlight it and run all the code we just did again. Um, with the with the run button, um, so that's 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 one thing. And actually, what I probably should have done um, is save this script, so I know where to where to put it. So I just click that save button there. It should open up in your working directory. I'm just going to call it script because again, I'm pretty unimaginative imaginative with my naming of things. Alrighty, um, let me just have a look at where we're at. So that was. That was plotting. We had a brief discussion about ggplot. Um, if we have time, maybe I can go into a little bit more detail later on about um, ggplot. But for the time being, um, let, let's 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 leave it there. Um, but like I said, there's some really cool things you can do with it. Um, so a simple model in R, uh, and in this case, we're just going to fit a linear regression model. And regression analysis is basically a statistical process of fitting coefficients to an estimated model. Um, and when we say model, that's a, a formulation of the relationship between variables within your data set. Um, and in particular, linear regression, it's quite a common one. You can think of it um, in the when you have a single variable predictor or only one predictor variable and one variable you're trying to predict as fitting a line of best fit, right? Um, it's essentially how we can think of it. And to do it in R, it's actually pretty straightforward, especially because we've already kind of seen the syntax uh, we need. We can use this LM function. Um, and this, in this case, for this data set, what I want to do is I want to produce a model um, for cholesterol based on age and based on gender uh, or the gender category. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify the model um, and I'm going to save it somewhere so I can um, look it up when I want to. I want to tell R to remember um, that this is a model I'm interested in. So I'm going to say model. I'm going to use this uh, um, allocation operator to say I want to save into this object model LM, which is the linear model code to fit a, a linear model in R. And I'm going to, again, structure it in the statement cholesterol by, and in this case, age and gender. So I'm going to write Col by age and 
gender. And again, I have to tell it what data set to be looking for these variables in. Um, and if I click run that, that was control enter to run that, um, it saves that model variable. And if you want to just see what, what the kind of the default output is when I return the model variable into the console, it looks like this. And it's essentially, it spits out the formula that I used and the intercept value and the coefficients associated with that particular linear regression. This is a multiple linear regression because I've got multiple uh, variables. If I was just doing a line of best fit um, fitting, um, for instance, cholesterol with respect to age, I could just drop off this variable, fit it again. Um, and when I return the model, this would be my y-intercept of my line of best fit, and this would be my x-intercept. For my, oh, so, sorry, this would be my slope of the line of best fit. Uh, but I'm interested in a uh, in a uh, multiple linear regression, so I'm going to add both these variables in. And of course, you can add as many variables as you want. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of things to go into here, which we just don't have time to to really explain. Um, but if I want to have a look at the you know, a little bit more detailed information than just what the actual values of the coefficients are, I can again use the summary function. So if I go summary model, now I'm going to get this more detailed output, which gives me an explanation of the, the coefficients that I um, spit out. And again, I need to rerun this because I want to include the gender coefficient. Um, uh, and it gives me a lot more detail here. Now, remember that gender is a categorical variable um, in, in our data set. And so R is quite clever. It knows to treat it as a categorical variable because it was, a, uh, um, it was saved as a character type of variable. Um, if I hadn't have up here, if I hadn't um, told uh, that this was a factor, it might not have known um, that this was that this was a categorical variable. It might have just treated it as zero one data. Now, for zero one data, it's actually equivalent uh, to treating it as a categorical variable. I'm not going to explain that. But if there was more levels to it, you certainly have to specify uh, that this was a categorical variable. Um, but if I look at my output here, I can see. Okay, this is my estimate. This is my standard error. This is my t statistic, and this here is my p value. And um, if anyone's familiar with linear regression, we can say that well, age was significant, a significant uh, predictor for cholesterol. Um, and the ma and males had a significantly different um, cholesterol level to females. Hmm. All righty. So um, you can also perform your assumption checking, and I probably should have performed my assumption checking um, in relation to this, uh, but because that you know requires a, a bit of a bit more detail and a bit more explanation about the, the mathematical theory behind linear regression, I'm just going to leave it there. Um, but note that you can generate all your diagnostic plots pretty easily in R um, by just writing plot around it around that model. And if I return that, it would generate all my diagnostic plots that I, I would need um, to make a determination around the assumptions of the model. All righty. Well, that was that was kind of like the, the explanation part. Um, I'll just check the chat. Are there any kind of questions uh, or comments? And also, Brad, I've been answering the question. Yeah, okay, fine. cool. Yeah. Yeah, cool. No worries. Um, well, let's have a look at maybe um, doing a full worked example of what this actually might look like um, if I was to try and apply R to do my analysis, what, what a common analysis might look like. So I'm going to open up a different data set now. And this data set is actually an SBSS data set. Um, sorry, I'll put that up there so you can see. It's called diabetes. I might have to, can I open this? Open with uh, SPSS. I probably should have had it open already. Sorry about that. It's going to take a while. But essentially, it's a um, SPSS file with these variables in it. 
So it's uh, it's got a, for, for each patient, it tells me whether or not they have diabetes and it gives me a few different uh, measures, variable measures um, that we might be able to use to predict uh, whether or not somebody has diabetes. And this data actually comes, uh, and I've got an explanation of exactly where it comes from, so I don't get it wrong. It comes from the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Um, it's a long-standing thing. I think they did it in 1980s. Um, and this particular data set uh, pertains to tw females of at least 21 years old um, with Pima Indian heritage or Native American heritage in, in the US. And okay, so, but we've got our, our data, you know, saved in an SVSS file. We can actually load this directly into R and we can do it with a package called Haven. And if I open up my R session again, let's try actually opening up my worked example doc. I've got all my code that I want to run for this particular example saved already. And I've gone through and I've commented it nicely. Um, and so I can use this Haven package. Now, if you haven't um, installed Haven before, you might have to install it. Um, but the way you kind of do it without having to remember exactly this code is go file, import data set, and we can go from SPSS and I can import, if I click browse, my diabetes data set and click import and actually generates that code for you and it opens the data viewer as well. Um, but I've just, you know, taken this, copied and pasted these two lines and put them up here. Notice that when you copy and paste it, don't include the greater than symbol, <laughs> otherwise it won't work. So when you copy and paste it, you have to kind of delete those parts off. All right. So if I decided to make changes to that data set and I needed to reload it in again, or if it's in a brand new session, I don't have to do that import data set thing. I can just go, I can just run these two lines of code, right? Highlight that, click run. And I've got my diabetes data set already loaded in there again. If I have a look at what it looks like, again, we've got um, our variables loaded in and I've got, this is actually, cleverly been known as uh, saved as a, a value with a label attached to it. Um, that's one way of doing it and it can produce outputs with it. And that's how it's been saved in SPSS. Um, but I'm more of a fan of saving it into the factor uh, kind of uh, variable type um, in R. And so I'm going to convert this into a factor variable type and I'm gonna tell it that the levels or the categories within that thing, which they've labeled one and two, um, which actually I think I've labeled it the wrong way because one corresponds to has no, has diabetes and two corresponds to no diabetes. Um, I can label it that way. All right, so if I do my proportion statistics, again, I can just tell it to table the categorical variable and I can see that 109 people have a, uh, have diabetes, 223 don't. And if I want the proportion, I divide it by the total number of people in the data set or the number of rows of diabetes. And I get my proportions of 32% uh, has diabetes, 67% no diabetes. Um, I can calculate statistics for the different cohorts of those who have diabetes and those who don't. Um, in this case, I'm going to get it to produce uh, the five number summary and the and the mean as well by using the summary function. So if I run it again, there we go. I've got my glucose, my min, my first quartile, my median, my mean, my third quartile, my max. I have that again for my BMI data. I have that again for my age. Um, and if I want to get some nice plots to really visualize what's going on here, I can see the difference between the has diabetes data set, the BMI. Uh, so the BMI is higher on average, the glucose levels far, uh, were higher on, on average, and the age is higher on average and the has diabetes, all right? So we can get a sense of what's going on with our data. I can also get a nice plot on my data 
Um, in this case, I'm going to use ggplot because I'm a fan of ggplot. Um, and if I run this line of code, the way I kind of read this is I want to create a ggplot on the diabetes data set. And what I want to do is I want to create um, uh, points. It's called a geom because that's the, the geometry that we're plotting here. Um, and I want to link between my data set and my plot using it, what's called an aesthetic mapping. That's why it says AES here. I want to link X to BMI. I want to link Y to glucose. And I want to link the color of the, the points to diabetes status. So if I run that line of code, oh, there we go. I've fallen into the trap of not loading in the package. Um, I can I can open, I can generate my plot. And so we can get a sense here, this has glucose uh, versus BMI. Um, we can get a sense that there is some kind of association going on here. All right. How would I create BMI categories from this data set? That is a good question. It re requires a little bit of coding. Um, but there are some functions uh, that help help you do it. Um, so if you wanted to categorize your variable, there's a function in the tidyverse set of data uh, of packages um, called cut interval um, or cut widths, and you can specify how to create categories. Um, you can also do it using base R codes. Um, using if statements. So I say if, you know, something like if B, uh, data BMI is greater than, I don't know what the, uh, you know, let's go 35. How about that? Go greater than 35. Um, um, and then I want to have BMI cat. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is probably a little bit complex coding to us for, 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 for this. Um, but I can say I want it to be one. Um, and if I originally initialize this to be zero, then I can get it out. Essentially, the way we the way we do it is we say, Um, I want it to be a vector. I want it to be a vector of zeros. Um, and then I want to save it as one that will, that will do it. But have I, where have I stuffed up? Oh, is it not called BMI in my data set? Oh, it's called di diabetes, not data, isn't it? Sorry. There we go. And then I can categorize it. The NA, the NA is here. I could also just do less than or equal to and then put that as zero. Um, or I could do an is NA thing. Um, I thought that that would rep. But anyway, that's all right. So that's how you do it in base R code. It's a little bit complicated, um, but that's why I tend to use tidyverse because tidyverse, I could do something like cut interval um, <laughs> and it'd be much, much nicer. Um, but, you know, anyway. All right. Um, let's try and fit a logistic regression model here because we've got a binary predictor uh, dependent variable we want to try to predict whether or not someone has diabetes or not based on glucose, BMI, and age. Um, so the way I do it is I tell uh, R to fit a GLM. I tell it to fit diabetes by glucose um, and BMI and age. And because I want it to fit a logistic regression, I have to tell R that it is a binomial. 
which means it's binary essentially in this case um, with a logit link. That's what a logistic regression is. Um, but yeah, essentially you can Google this code if you, if you don't remember it. Um, and if I write, if I run that, it will fit my diabetes model. And here I will get, just like with the LM model, I get my coefficients returned and I'll also give uh, an, uh, an example of the call. But that's not too much help to us if we're doing statistical analysis. We actually want to look at things like p-values and standard errors and all that kind of stuff. So again, I just wrap that with summary and out pops a similar kind of summary as what we got with the linear model. Um, now, I've got here, I've got my intercept term, I've got my glucose term, I've got my BMI term, I've got my age term. As you can see, they're all significant in their mod in the model. Um, so they're all uh, great at predicting um, diabetes status within the model. And if I want to produce odds ratios associated with this, all I have to do is get it to spit out the coefficients and then take exponential of it. And that's my odds ratio. And again, I can get my confidence interval. So I just wrap it in this confidence interval function that spits out my confidence intervals. And if I want to get that in the same kind of um, scaling, so confidence intervals for my odds ratios, I just take exponential of that again. And that gives me my, my odds ratio confidence intervals. All right, now, if I want to do this all at once, like I said, I promised that, um, the whole point of writing a script is if you wanted to open a new session and let's try restarting a session and see if this works. So I'm gonna restart R, it's gonna clear out, I'm gonna clear out my working directory, uh, my, my environment. So R knows nothing, it's gonna be just like a brand new session. Clear that out, starting from, uh, from scratch again. I should be able to highlight all this and click run and it should be able to generate all the analysis I just did. This is when we talk about the reproducibility of our research. We go from our very raw starting point, um, which is our data set that we've loaded in, and it does all the analysis for us, and I can just copy and paste it. And again, once you get the right set of code, um, if you get other examples, you can just copy and paste that code and go again from there. All righty. Um, is there, I think, I think that's all I've got kind of prepared, but I'm happy to answer any questions or go through any any specific points. Yeah, or if you make a mistake, like I made some mistakes in my codes, I certainly, it's easy to, to fix up and, and rerun. Or I'm thinking more if you've got a mistake in your data set, which often happens and you have to go back and fix it. Um, it's quite different, say SPSS, where you would need to redo the whole thing. This is dynamic. So if you make a change in your data set, you can update the analysis really quickly. Yeah, let's let's give that a go. Let's let's make this ridiculous, but we should see a change in our in our um in our data. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Now, if we have a look, I probably should do a plot of, instead of glucose and BMI, do a plot of uh, glucose and age. There we go. We can see it's followed through on that complete change I just made to the data frame, data set. Yeah, um, a difference between an R script and an R markdown document. That's a really good question. Um, the document I actually had up here, which I've, of course, I've restarted my session, so it's gotten out of it, um, actually came from a R Markdown document that I, I generated. And I'll show you what that looks like. So an R Markdown document is basically like the mixture of a, a, a kind of a text document where you can insert in chunks of code. Um, and so this is what mine looks like. This is using what's called the visual editor, which is a really handy tool, especially for those new to R Markdown. So I can produce the document that I created with all the instructions. Uh, sorry, it's because I moved the, the, the directory. So let me just, 
uh, turn a val equals true on here and a val equals false on here. And I will have to do it again wherever this is. And if I click knit, it should generate a very nice looking document in my viewer. And basically, so what it is, is it's like working out of a text document where you can insert chunks of R code. Um, and so for me, I've got, this is a chunk of R code. Of course, it's just a comment, so it doesn't really do anything. Um, here I've got chunks of R code that does all that analysis that we that we ran through, right? And so it actually spat out, you know, of course I have to load it in, hang on. This is what happens when you have to code live. It always, it always goes, goes wrong a little bit. There we go. Um, and if I press this plus button, now it actually generates all that code. And here's the nice output that I was going through before. So an R Markdown document is basically like a mixture of a script and a Word document, and you can generate your code live within it. The, the advantage of it is that you can actually do that for a publication. So you can hide the code and just pr produce all your text and plots and tables, and you could submit that. Um, you can do it as a HTML or as a Word document or as a PDF. You can insert references. You can insert, insert images. So you could actually then submit that to a journal. And again, the advantage is it's reproducible. And if you've made a mistake in your data, there's nothing more annoying than anyone who's written a paper in a Word document. If you've got a mistake in a table, you have to go back and fix everything. If you're using R Markdown, all you have to do is fix the data and rerun it, and it'll fix everything, your tables, your plots, absolutely everything. <laughs> 